This is the Wally and Mathot Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. Now here are your hosts, Brent Wallace and Mark Mathot. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wally and Mathot Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. <laughs> yes, Matt. I'm glad you paid attention in the meeting. All right. I'm Brent Wallace. He's Mark Mathot, the former Syracuse Crunch and one-time NHL player. Um, Matt, before we begin, as you know, we're sponsored by Barhaven Ford. And since we brought them on board, there's been a lot of traffic at the store. There's been a lot of traffic on the website. So I'm thinking we might be able, if you go in with your hockey talk sweet voice and convince them to get us maybe a BFC custom F-150 for you and a custom Roush-inspired Mustang for me. That sounds really good. All I need right now, though, is a new battery. My truck won't even start in the driveway. So if we can just work something out with them for that, I'd be happy. So I I don't ask much of you. I'm asking that you are now going to take care of this and see if we can't snag some perhaps new vehicles. Okay, I'm on it. Okay, They're, for, they're for sure going to give us all new trucks, for sure. <laughs> in fact, everybody who listens to the show, uh, go to Barhaven Ford uh, 555 dealership drive. they got all kinds of vehicles, the largest inventory in Ottawa. All right, let's move on. Um, fun show today. In fact, we have Belleville Senators head coach Troy Mann stopping by. It's a long chat, but it's got great stuff in it. It is so much fun to talk to him. Lots of things to talk about, including analytics, where a lot of people are interested in. Uh, you talk a lot to him about systems. That is quenched by whitewaterbeer.ca. Don't forget, use the Walling Method coupon. Save 15% on your beer. Uh, shop whitewater.ca. Uh, of course, on the points brought to you by sportsinteraction.com. We're going to give you our latest picks. And of course, in trivial trivia, which we don't ever spend a whole lot of time on thinking about these actual trivia questions, we are giving away a gong show sauce off kit. But first, as always, Beth, to the headlines. Brought to you by BEI, Bonisher Excavating Inc., helping to shape the Ottawa Valley. BonisherExcavating.com. Let's get to it. Winning the lottery, Ottawa will draft 10th overall in the upcoming draft. Buffalo gets first overall. I'm going to get your thoughts on that and what you think about the Buffalo Sabres' the first pick. Northern Stars, Montreal keeps rolling and takes game one against the Jets. Uh, the Shifley hit on Evans. I'm going to get your thoughts on this hit. It has generated, obviously, tons of chat. Let's just see what you think of that hit from a defenseman role. Uh, respect the jersey. Is there fan protocol? Doug Gilmore upset that people are burning his jersey. Uh, and the weathered Leafs. Leafs collapse and what's next? I, this has drawn so much attention about the Toronto Maple Leafs and what's going on with them. So we're going to get your thoughts on that. But first, the winning the lottery. So the Buffalo Sabres get the first overall pick. The disaster that they are, that have been for a long time, they get rewarded. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's start with Ottawa. They get 10th overall. Do you like the pick? Would you keep the pick? Would you move it to try and bring in some assets now? And I'm thinking it looks like, and I hope everybody's right, that Mason McTavish from CARP will end up as a member of the Ottawa Senators. Yeah, I, I like the pick. I mean, obviously, getting a little luckier and getting into that top five would be nice. It's not a super deep draft, but We've been lucky enough, Wally, you and I and Craig, to, to interview some of these kids. And Mason McTavish happened to be one of them. And um, I just love the type of player that they potentially can get in him. He's a hard-nosed guy that has a little bit of a scoring touch as well. He's incredibly competitive. I mean, this fits the bill if you're wanting to play under TJ Smith in Ottawa with the Senators. And, and with Brady there right now, and, and again, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Yeah. I don't expect a player like him to get into the lineup just right away. Obviously, he has to groom up a little bit before he gets to that level. But I think there's opportunity there. And I, I don't think I'd trade the pick away. I'd go with it and, and see what you get out of that 10. And if you can land a guy like McTavish, it's great for the organization. It's pretty simple. I, I just don't – with the amount of young players we have in this group right now, you could make the argument that you could use that asset to go find another player, make a hockey trade with it. But for me, it's simple. Go with the pick. You're going to get a really good player out of that. Um, good enough, at least for a top 10 type player. And – um, it's going to help the team out in the long run. I'm, I'm just a really big fan of Mason McTavish. Just based off the interview we yeah. did with him, I guess I'm a little biased. Well, but he's got a personality, right? And you want a guy that's got a personality. You, want, you like his bloodlines. His dad played in the NHL. His dad, a very good hockey player, very good coach. And you sense that there's a lot of raw talent there with him. Size is great. He looks like he can move pretty well. I, I don't want to say he's Mark Stone because that's it, but he gives you that sense of the size Stone. and skill. Yeah, and he's got like a he's got a bit of a fiery attitude, and I yeah. know he plays that way. But I feel like the type he's the type of player that could come into the NHL at you know twenty even 
and and really have an impact just because he doesn't really seem like a kind of guy that'll have a ton of respect or too much respect rather for his opponents. I feel like he'll come yes. right in there like a bull in a China shop and just make a lot of noise. So I'm I'm excited to see what they get out of that pick, assuming that they can land him. And his head of hair kind of reminds me of Mark Stone. That's just an added <laughs> it's true. Uh, your yeah. thoughts on Buffalo getting first overall? Yeah, and 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 with uh, we saw the interview. I don't know who if you saw that Wally, but Kevin Adams was interviewed yep. right after, and you could see the relief on his face. Right, he just yeah. kind of seemed um, relieved. Right, he was just really happy that they landed it, uh, like a big weight off his shoulders. And they asked him, "Well, what's?" what's the need that Buffalo wants to address right off the bat? He's like, well, pretty well everywhere. <laughs> so, so you got to think they're just going to go with the best available pick. And I had the pleasure of watching Owen Power a little bit in that world championship. So it's a perfect question for me. I mean, he's six foot five, six, six, he's two seventeen. He skates very well. He's got a really good head on his shoulders. Good hockey sense. He's very sound defensively. Again, is he a first overall pick in this year's draft? He probably will be. Uh, uh, he's not a kind of guy that's going to come in and light the lamp and put up 25 goals, of course. But I think for, for you know, a really good building block that probably can jump into the NHL very quickly. And to me, that's that's the perfect fit for Buffalo. I don't know what they have in store. I'm sure they've already got all their mock lists up. But for me, just based off what I saw with Owen Power, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him go first overall. And the adage is you always take the best player, not what you need, right? So you exactly. take the guy with the most skill. I, I just... I don't know if I'm just old and jaded. I don't like that Buffalo has been a tire fire for 10 years and they get rewarded with the first overall pick again, since uh, Rasmus Sandin or Rasmus Sandin. Rasmus Dahlin. Sorry. Dali. Yeah, no, yeah. no, I know you meant. And he had a tough go too. Right. So, I mean, if you bring in a player like Owen power and just based off what I saw at the world's playing with men, and this is a perfect little segue you gave me. He's such a good defensive player. He's so strong and sound that, he, if you pair him with a player like Dolly, and I really think he could turn his game around because everybody needs backup on the ice, right? Especially when you're a more skilled, offensively minded D-man. I know I'm stating the obvious. Everybody already knows this stuff. But I, I think in this particular case with power, as I said earlier, he can jump into the NHL right away and have an immediate impact. It's just a perfect fit. All right. I, I'm just tired of them being rewarded. Okay. Uh, we're going to go I from the, you. I hear you. I know. the future to the present, and that's Northern Stars. So. Montreal keeps rolling along and takes game one in Winnipeg last night. Are you shocked Easy. by this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I am shocked to a degree uh, because I think going into the playoffs, if you told me that Winnipeg was going to be facing Montreal in that second round, <laughs> I would have laughed and been like, they're going to, Montreal's going to get steamrolled. But based off the last three games that they're riding against Toronto and the way they've been playing, it's like, they just continue that, right? They're getting good goaltending, obviously, at a price. But more importantly, they're finally playing the way they're built, the way they've yeah. been meant to, you know, to perform. And that's dirty areas being very hard to play against in front of their own net and very hard to play against in front of the opposition's net, in this case, in front of Hellebuck. And with that decor they have uh, in Winnipeg, I just, I wasn't, and, and our friend of the show there, Sean Simpson, he made a really good point. I got to give him a little love on this. He made an excellent point in that Winnipeg's decor is just very thin and they really are. They never really made any big additions at the deadline and it's coming back to haunt them now. So I could go through their names. I mean, you've got like Morrissey and well, no, and but they lose Dylan DeMello, right? Yeah. Well, no, I know. Shift. So, so, so they're not, they're not deep at all. And they're actually, they have, they didn't move the puck very well either. And they just seemed flat footed all the time. Montreal was just too overwhelming. We saw Corey Perry, Corey Perry is my age. And, and, and credit to Paris because I played with him in junior. He's a great guy. But the way he was moving around them at net front, he made them look brutal and, and, yeah. and just couldn't contain him. So if Montreal keeps that up, I mean, they've got a good opportunity here to, to actually get out of the north. And it's just – it's incredible to me. And it's just, just to show you this year. I mean, you can't even predict any of this stuff. It's so difficult. But they looked very good. And right now they're riding on some serious momentum. And we'll talk about game two a bit later in on the points, but I want to go back. They lose Paul Statsny before the game starts, and then they lose Dylan DeMello. Were they not handcuffed early on going into this game? And I'm going to say coming off the break. It's either going to work for you or against you, and I thought it worked against them. They just seemed flat at the beginning, like you mentioned. Yeah, but but when you lose a guy like Dylan DeMello, obviously it's an impact player because he's eating up a lot of minutes, but it shouldn't affect your lineup that much. I mean – this isn't Jake Muzzin in Toronto. It's a little different. And I love 
Mello. Like he's a, he's yep. a really good role player to have on your team, but right now he's playing big minutes. He rather was playing big minutes on that top pairing with Morrissey. And it's like, you know, you should still be able to kind of figure things out if you're that group. And, and with the forward group they have, I just thought they weren't engaging enough. It, they, it almost looked like they came out tentative. I was expecting Winnipeg to come out flying. Like the way I knew that team when I would play against them, a lot of those same guys are still there. Um, they just overwhelm you with, with their physical presence and play. And they come at you in waves and they're, they're really hard to play against on their four check. They come at you, they finish their checks. I just thought they weren't very engaging. I thought Montreal did that. So again, that could just be that long layoff. Montreal still coming off a high there and, you know, it worked to their benefit because they were, they were engaged right off the bat. They were still in game mode. Winnipeg looked like they had to get the cobwebs out. So you'll probably get a much better response out of that game too. Yeah. But again, it's just, okay, it's too well, hard to pick this stuff. Game two may have a drastic impact on the Winnipeg lineup. There might not be stats need DeMello or Mark Shifley based on the end and, of that and, game. And that's, yeah. And I wanted to leave, I wanted to so, save that one for after, but yeah. So and now let's get into the Shifley hit on Jake Evans, is. end of the game. Yeah. Well, what do you, I, what? I, okay, so before you begin, because you're the guy that's played the game, you understand it from a whole different angle than I do. I'm going to give you devil's advocate so you can shoot it down. And that is Jake Evans is coming around the net. His job is to put that puck in the net. But he yeah. also knows that Mark Shifley is coming after him. So at the point of impact, just as he scores, Jake Evans still has the puck, basically, as Mark Shifley explodes through him now it is a hard hit it's a devastating hit i is it not i'm gonna so i can feel is it a legal hit so this is the argument well for me at least so now you can suspend a player if it's deemed that he's an incredibly um defenseless position right so yeah. the hit may be somewhat clean but according to the new rules now you can suspend the player for that reckless hit, right? Or but whatever. you know he's coming. I know. So if you're Evans, first of all, you know there's guys like it's a one goal game at this point, right? Yep. So you know that you've got back checkers coming for you for sure, especially on that dump in. It's not like he's cruising in towards the net with full control and all he has to do is tap it in. He's Evans has to chase the puck behind the net and wrap it. So again, I'm and I don't want to lean too much and back you on your side, Wally, but it's hard because it happens so quickly. So it's all about timing. Evans gets hit almost immediately as he's uh, wrapping the puck around the net, right, before he scores. Yep. And Shifley comes in, bulldozes him. Now, there's only one argument I can make for Shifley, and it's that the timing was just was perfect timing. The hit was almost on point, and it was a hockey play to a degree. Now, if you're arguing against Shifley, you can make this argument. Well... There's no attempt to poke the puck. His stick is cocked right back and he's lowering his shoulder going into Evans. So that, that alone to me means he wasn't attempting to play the puck. He was just trying to hurt Evans. So I, I do, I do think it's an incredibly dangerous hit. Uh, I don't like it, but I also don't like the idea that you, that Evans gets a free pass because the contact is made while he still has control of the puck or, or he just, just got rid of it. But in any case, we all know that Shifley was frustrated at that point, right? He had taken the penalty at the end there and then he's out there. He's frustrated. You, you think he is concerned. frustrated. You don't Pardon? know. You don't know his mindset. No, I don't. No, I don't. But I have a good idea that he's probably frustrated. Things weren't going his way during the game. And he takes the liberty on Evans right there at the end. But again, I'm only speculating. I don't know that. So if you're going to base it off the rules, and if the rules are Evans is incredibly defenseless, then maybe maybe you give Shifley a game. I, I just I don't like it because okay. to me I'm I'm almost on your side to a degree, Wally. Okay, but is Evans this, has the puck. That's what's for, that's what's hard here. I need to go back to this whole stick check thing. As a defenseman, your entire career is predicated on playing the body. Right? right, you were never to play the puck. Right. So if his, so if he's go like, why is this such a big argument that he doesn't try to play the puck? That's so, not his job is to play so the puck. My, it's to remove him from the play. Yeah, it's to separate my, him. Yes, and I agree with you there, Wally. And that was my issue with a lot of the, um, the outrage, if you will, online. I don't really understand it. Like, look, I, I've never like, and I've got to say this because I don't want people to jump down my throat. I've never been suspended. I've always played very clean. Yeah. Um, but. 
to me, it's like the timing of it all. It's the hit. You just mentioned it, Wally. He's got the puck. You're fair game if you've got the puck on your skin. So, uh, it, so it, you don't have to like the hit. Yes, it looks violent, but I mean, so he Mark might get a game is not supposed to hit him, or is he supposed to let up because it's a playoff game? I like it, either you have hitting or the game. I know. Or you I, don't. I hate this. I hate this question, and I'm so curious to see what he gets. Okay, but if you ask me. If I want to appease the mob, then I'll say this. Yeah, give Mark Shifley a game. It looked bad. It was not pretty. And he was Evans was stretchered off. So from an optics standpoint, this is this is terrible. This looks really bad. But he had the puck. And, and unless now you break it down frame by frame, I didn't look at it every angle. If there's a headshot in there, then my arguments all my arguments null and void. And you, he's gonna you just said it. He lowers his shoulder though, like he. Yeah, as but he if, goes yeah, but, if it, but if the primary point of contact is Evans' head, but then of course. But, but if you're Zdeno Chara and you lower your shoulder, it's going to know, be the primary. I know. I know. So I, don't like I just it. have one. Like, okay, here's the last question, and then we'll move on. Yeah. Is if you are Mike Mark Shifley, what are you doing in that situation? Because you've played the game. Oh, I'm I'm running right through him. I'm running right through him. I'm not even thinking about it. The positioning, the timing. But Evans is right there. There's so you much make outrage that, that he's going to get suspended based on outrage. Well, I maybe think. it's a charge. It, it might be a charging penalty. Maybe if you don't, if he you doesn't just really skate. don't. Like I know. Yeah, I know. He's he's not in stride. I know that he's gliding, but he's got a head of steam. That's the only thing, Wally. Like, if I'm going to play devil's advocate so, here, he's. Going really so fast. So you're Paul Maurice, and you want Mark Shifley now to gingerly skate up the ice to try and stop the empty net goal. I know. I'm with. I'm with you. I'm trying to understand the other vantage points. So That's all. It, and and, I, and I understand. Maurice did call it a highly unusual play, which is fair, uh, and a heavy, yeah. heavy hit. So I, think I agree. All That's a really good point. This this never happens. You know, it's just it's a freak play with an unfortunate ending to it. And I hope Evans is okay. But I mean. I'm 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 with I'm sort of with you on this. I want to argue with you because your shirt is bothering me, but I can't do it. Like I can't. So this is this is like my Sunday best. Is you look um like you're working at a gas station? You're like wearing a, a ball cap and a white it's like a Petro Canada shirt. Like was this the only thing on the floor? <laughs> um, the last thing on this, Joel Edmondson after the game said, uh, if Shifley isn't suspended or perhaps when he does come back, they're going to make his life miserable. Which and again. I think it's going to draw attention though, if something's premeditated, because it goes back to the whole Marty McSorley, Donald Brashear incident. Like uh, it'll be nothing ever usually happens in these things. They always are pretty quiet, but that yeah. would be interesting to keep an eye on. Uh, well, I, there was, and, and it, it'll come, it's going to come for him. If he's yeah. playing, even if, even when he comes back, they're going to come for him. I can tell you right now. And he, it's not, it's going to be, they're going to be all over him. And he, but he's that type of player. Like he plays a little bit on the edge. He's a little bit of a prick out there. Like I can see Sife, the attention. Sife is a he's really playing. competitive player. And he's yeah. actually like the, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet off the, uh, you know, off the ice. Yeah. He's such a soft spoken guy. And then he gets out there and he's got this competitive edge that flicks on. So uh, yeah, it'll be, he, he can handle it, but it's not going to be easy because they got a big imposing decor there on that back end of Montreal. Uh, we're going to go from respecting the player to respecting the Jersey. And this one makes me kind of chuckle. Now, so Doug Gilmore is upset that somebody posted a picture of a burning Doug Gilmore jersey in a barrel, and he tweeted, well, this is very disappointing. How do I approach this? We're all disappointed the Leafs didn't make it to the second round. This is on social media, picture of the burning jersey. This guy setting my jersey on fire. I don't play for the Leafs, but I support the Leafs. Please respect the Leafs jersey, and if you don't want it, donate it to a charity hospital or someone you know. Charities are desperate to raise money right now. And these jerseys can help them if you don't want them. Okay, I have a couple points for I'm going to give this to you. It's not his jersey. It's not his game-worn jersey from 1993 that's autographed by every member of the Toronto Maple Leafs. It might be from China, and it could be a knockoff. The last thing is, if you have a receipt that says, I paid for this jersey, you can do whatever you want with it. You can throw it around. You can tear it up. You can cut it up. You can let the dog wear it. I don't care. It's not a game-worn jersey that's in the Hockey Hall of Fame. You're right. a player. I'm going to assume you're going to argue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there's a lot here. I mean, I think the first thing is, if this if this dummy decides to burn his jersey and post it online, I think he's fair game to be criticized, right? I mean, if, if he doesn't post that online, nobody cares. You don't hear about it, right? So 
he's obviously doing it for attention, just like everybody else does. Sure. And it is idiotic. Like, let's be honest. If you really don't like them that much and you're trying to prove a point, I mean, just take a video of yourself donating it to, you know, Okay, but Some no one's saying the charity wants it. Like it might just be a cheap fifty dollar jersey. The charity That's not doesn't. The point. I know, I know. But the point is, you're burning. We all know exp- jerseys for the most part are generally pretty expensive. I mean, whether they're knockoffs or not, but they're not cheap. And to me, it is an ultimate, the ultimate sign of disrespect. I mean, you're burning a sweater. I, I just, I'm not a huge fan of that, I, especially, especially videotaping it and putting it on social media. I mean, I don't know what the, I, and I get it. The fan base is is very passionate. And they're very, it's very, you know, it's a frustrating moment for them. Um, but I don't think that justifies burning a jersey, posting it online to prove a point. You know, when you see the name bar and you see Marner, Marner's name bar in flames, it's just, I don't know. I think as a player, it probably just hits me a little different, but I, I'm not a fan of that. And I don't, well, I would never condone anything like it. I mean, if my okay, kid did something like that growing up, I'd give him an earful. You know what I mean? Okay, so let me put it to you this way, because I think we're put, like it is a piece of clothing. If I yeah. took all my TSN stuff and put it in a burn barrel and burned it, yeah, are you going to be as upset with me as you are about a jersey being burned? Well, I'm not upset right now. I'm just like 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 you, Wally. I don't really care what yeah. they do with those jerseys, but I can understand if you're a, a you know a, a retired player like Doug Gilmore, a Hall of Fame player who's passionate about that, you know, the, that team, I guess I can understand him coming in and trying to say something, just trying to cool down the fan base a bit and not encouraging that. Cause stuff like this can create, you know, a bit of a snowball effect where they, people, you know, a lot of fans are very passionate. They'll notice one guy get a ton of attention yep. with that particular video. So they'll think, okay, this is a good opportunity for me. I'm going to go burn my Jersey. Sure. now. It's like, I think they're just trying to put a stop to it before it gets any bigger. I get now. Did you play in Ottawa? I can't remember the year they threw the Jersey on the ice. Were you there? It was at the end of the season. I want to say, and somebody threw what a year was that. I'm trying to think, I'm trying uh, to think if I was there or not. They, have, they all run together. And I want to, f- I feel like you were, but it doesn't matter. Point is yeah. if well, you're playing, and I, you I don't see like, it, if you see it on the ice, does it really matter? Like, yeah, I, okay. So, but just so people know in the room, in the dressing room, that jersey is to never touch the floor, even if it's a practice jersey or whatever. The logo never touches the floor. And I think so it's just, it, yeah. There's, yeah. A, there's a respect factor if exactly. you play it, but exactly. I don't, I don't, I don't have any allegiance to the t- like. I, if I want to burn my jersey, it's I paid for it. Like yeah. people need to like. Why are you getting so upset over? It's just an article of clothing. It's not. I didn't steal it from the Toronto Maple Leafs. It is something. Well, people I are getting upset for. because they don't like the idea of somebody in their own fan base burning a burning a jersey and putting it online and it garners all that attention and it's just it's not representative of the majority of the fan base who are loyal reasonably intelligent people so i think that's what it is it's more of that's people are mad because they don't want that to be a representation of the rest of the fan base right so they try to squash it right away and say we don't condone that that's not who we are and again you make a good point it's just you paid for it you're entitled to do whatever you like but it doesn't mean that i have to like it and that I have to enjoy the fact that you posted it online. All right. I mean, I'm not going to now burn my Crosby Jersey in, you know, as a sign of respect for you. So I, sure. I will hold off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, finally, uh, the withered leaves, <laughs> this debacle is so entertaining to watch because you just get to sit back and see how this all unfolds. There's been so much said and written. Uh, what did the Toronto Maple Leafs need to do with so much talent to try and win in the postseason, because I think what they did in the postseason is try to play a regular season hockey game. Well, I mean, and, and we're everyone's going to try to dissect it. I mean, they finished first in the North, so before everybody calls for Kyle Dubas's head over there, I think they have to understand that he put together a good team. Like, like for me, it's it's simple. It's like he could go down into that locker room during the playoffs if he wanted and be like, you know, give them an earful and be like, "What, what are you guys doing?" I've given you everything you need, like perform now. And their top guys didn't do that. They kind of disappeared. Um, their role players actually weren't like Spezza had, a, had himself a series. Oh, fantastic. Thornton, Thornton had a bit of a rough go, but he was good in the final stretch. But I thought Thornton kind of withered a little bit. And, and that's not a slight at Joe Thornton because he's, you know, an incredible, has had an incredible career. But him and Simmons weren't really, they looked a step behind a little bit in, in the postseason and they got okay goaltending I mean the numbers were good I thought they let yeah. by some some critical goals uh but I mean his save percentage was pretty good in Campbell 
And I thought their decor was were, were pretty strong. They just I, they just didn't come up big when they needed to. And their forwards, their top end guys. And again, we can't forget Tavares gets hurt. Felino, you know, was was okay, but again, they just they were they were missing a lot of jump. And Montreal was more engaging. They found their way at at, at game four, or was it game five? Game yeah, game four. So it's like I, I just. I don't understand what happened. I don't think it's caused to blow everything up. They're stuck with a ton of money in those top four guys, um, particularly a few of them over $10 million. Is that how you win a Stanley cup? And I mean, now we can all make the argument, well, you need to spread out the money a little more. And now, you know, like, what are you going to do and how are you going to insulate these, these players with good, with good role guys when you've got all your money tied in on those particular players, your, your big three or four. So I just think at this point, people need to relax. It's brutal and it's worthy of all the discussion and the outrage. But I mean, what are you going to do? I, they finished first this year. And so maybe you have to revisit bringing in proper guys, some different players to kind of insulate around your top end players and hopefully have another really strong year and make the adjustment. Maybe this is a good learning opportunity for a guy like Marner and Matthews. And, and I think, I mean, Pittsburgh had to go through it with Crosby the first tough couple of times or even the first year, like you guys beat them up the first year that I think they were in the postseason, Right. And so it taught them like, you got to learn almost through losing how to be successful. And yeah, sure. it'll be interesting to see if Toronto can build off it. But, but the thing with Toronto, I find is they get all these veterans who want to come play there and just play for a million bucks. So they get to be able to add some skill. They have an advantage. Yeah. You can't keep adding a bunch of old guys because you see it in the postseason. You can have one or two, but if you have multiple, then you can't, yeah. there's no way to, right? There's no speed left in your game. Anyway. I think they just needed to be, I think they, that group, and I don't know what the dynamic is in that dressing room, of course, but I think if yeah. you're, I think maybe, and I, again, I'm only speculating that there might be a, an accountability issue when it came to that postseason because you know, Matthews and Marners run that team. And so if you're a veteran in that group, like you're not going to tear a strip off them, right? During the playoffs, because you're probably a little intimidated to do that. I don't think they should be. I think they should be able to call them out, but I think it's, I mean, I don't, maybe they did, but I think at some point someone's got to grab them and be like, Hey, like it's time to wake up here. Let's go. And I don't know that that happened because those two have all the power in that group. Uh, quickly, you brought it up about Dubas coming down in the middle of the playoffs and saying something in the room. Did you have any GMs do that when you played? Yeah. A Beamer did it. I mean, every GM I've ever played for has done it at least once, but I can remember Brian coming in. I think it was in um, New Jersey. Uh, and I forget the year, they all kind of roll into one, but I still remember him coming to anytime a general manager comes into the room, particularly a guy, a highly respected general manager, like the great Brian Murray, um, it wakes you up. You just sit there. It's very intimidating. And because you never hear him come in and, and he was not shy. Like he'll individually make call outs in the room, uh, and point right at you and say like, what are you doing? Like, were you not brought here for this and this and this? Like, he was unapologetic in his approach. And I think his players, we just had so much respect for it because he was also smart about it. Never made it really personal, but he would call you out. And so when a G when a GM comes down, it wakes you up. Does it always work? No. Um, but like, that would have been a good opportunity maybe for Dubas. But then the counter to that is at that point, you're talking to a team that finished first in its division. They know what it takes to win. So I don't know that he had to go down there, especially when you have veteran players mind you veteran players that haven't won a stanley cup right these are all players yeah they've never won in, in thornton simmons spets so they've got a, a a whirlwind of experience in felino but they've never been uh they've never held the stanley cup so there's another interesting point okay everybody who's listening uh will want me to ask you this one question and that who did brian murray call out oh i, I couldn't even remember it could have been uh it would have been a top end guy he'd never call out a a role player, but he, but he wasn't shy to go right to your captain or right to your assistants or, you know, one of the higher paid guys in the group and, and call them. And I, I mean, I'm being honest. I wouldn't mind yeah. throwing it out there right now. I can't remember the players. <laughs> and there were several. It could have, I could have been enough. one. Of them. I don't, but I don't remember. All right. Fair enough. All right. Those are the headlines built by BEI, Bonisher Excavating Inc., BonisherExcavating.com, helping to shape the Ottawa Valley. Time for a quick break. When we come back, the Troy Mann interview. Quenched by whitewaterbeer.ca. Use the volume of thought. 15% off coupon code. Get some home delivery, by the way. Uh, shop whitewater.ca. Uh, Meth, I don't know if you tried it, but the Dawn Patrol, the tangerine flavor is fantastic. Unbelievable. Um, oh, great. Yeah, no, it is very good. Uh, you know what? It's the same color as my shirt. That's why I'm wearing it. <laughs> 
you're watching the Wally Buffett oh, Show, powered by Bar Even Ford. Check out the all new BFC Roush inspired custom F 150s, Rangers, and my soon to be delivered Mustang. Welcome back to the Wally and Mathot Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. Barhaven Ford has recently introduced its all-star lineup of custom builds. It's the Barhaven Ford Customs. Barhaven Ford has brought in Roush-inspired custom F-150s, Rangers, and Mustangs to the nation's capital. At Barhaven Ford, they build the truck or Mustang the way you want it. That's right, customizing each truck or Mustang to fit your individual needs. They also have the largest inventory in the Ottawa region. Go to barhavenford.com slash bfc-customs today to order up your vehicle, and if not, stop in the dealership, 555 Dealership Drive in Barhaven. Now, here's the chat, quenched by whitewaterbeer.ca in our conversation with Troy Mann. Pleased to be joined now by the head coach of the Belleville Senators, Troy Mann, who's now get to en enjoy a bit of an offseason after I'm, well, just sum up how last season went for you and how you've had to work your way through this entire COVID protocol, strange setup situation. Yeah, I think the uh, the biggest word you could use is, you know, uh, adaptability. <laughs> you know, we uh, uh, faced a lot of adversity over the, the months, you know, in terms of where are we playing, where are we not playing, where are we going to live? Uh, so we, we talked to the players, you know, from day one, just about, you know, adapting and, and trying to have some flexibility along the way. So um, it was a roller coaster, but you know, I'm not going to complain about coaching. You know, it's, uh, there was points where I didn't even think we'd play games, so I'm not going to complain. Uh, the Sens, I thought, did a fantastic job once we got up and running and knew what we had to do. Uh, you know, we, we made the best of that situation, and uh, the players were fantastic to work with. So all in all, not going to complain one bit. How many days did you stay in the same hotel room? <laughs> I checked into the Brook Street uh, December 3rd and I checked out May 21st. So wow. let's just say the Starbucks there, the ladies in the morning knew my coffee. <laughs> oh my I can't imagine the hotel points. Um, so was it a bit of a bonus because that you were in Ottawa in the sense that you were around, I guess, all the NHL facilities, but I do know Belleville is a great setup. That facility is very well done. I'm just, was there any benefits to being in Ottawa? Yeah, I think from a call-up perspective, the taxi squad situation was certainly mm -hmm. a benefit. You know, having management there at every game, you know, uh, you know, Rob Murphy, as you know, lives in Ottawa. Uh, you know, he, he was at a lot of our games. So I think from those two perspectives, it was certainly uh, a lot of advantages. You, you know, like we could get home and, you know, Gus could be at practice the next morning, right? All you had to do was move his gear over to the CTC from the center. Right. So uh, those were the advantages, uh, you know, but the setup in Belleville is fantastic. So, um, you know, in, in a perfect world, you'd want to be there. But there were certainly some advantages of playing in the NHL city. No doubt about it. OK, you ended your season on a complete high minus the last game. But you won eight straight games set a franchise record. What transpired that led to this eight game winning streak? And did you see it coming? Could you see the build up? Yeah, I, I just thought that. Well, first of all, all, all our young kids were, you know, I, I think I've mentioned this to a number of people. This, this was one of the most fulfilling years in my coaching career and there was no playoffs, but it was just the work ethic. And, you know, you just didn't think about COVID or what was going on in the world when you went to the rink with this group uh, and the kids wanted to get better. And, you know, our veteran guys, you know, they got off to a lot of, a lot of them got off to slow starts. Right. And, I mean, when you're off the ice 15 months, not in NHL camp, don't play exhibition games. It just takes time. So I think the both of those combined allowed us to get better every week. And you could see that in the games. Um, you know, our first couple of weeks, I was like, I remember saying to our coaches, I don't know if guys, if we're going to win six games this year. You know, I remember one after uh, playing Laval, who were very, very deep this year, um, just with their veterans and, you know, a lot of their prospects in their second and third year, I was like, you know, geez, uh, I don't know, but uh, we just kept working at it and the players kept getting better, specifically, obviously, the draft picks and, 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 and prospects. And uh, it came together. It would have been nice to, to have a playoff or even continue to play some more games to see uh, where we would end it up. Coach, who are the, who are the clear cut leaders on, in that group? You know, for a lot of people that aren't following it as closely, were there any like strong voices driving that bus there, especially in that long stretch at the end? 
yeah, Logan Shaw is, you know, fantastic human being. And, and I like to call him an organizational guy and, and you yeah. see all, every organization has to have these type of players where they can go up and give the NHL club six to 10 games, but it's just a really good influence on the kids. Uh, Cole Castles is another one. Fantastic. You know, a lot of respect, you know, he's a hardworking, you know, Britt puts the work boots on in practice and gives it all in the games. Uh, you know, maybe not uh, giving you NHL games at this stage of his career, maybe down the line, but uh, you know, Hubie Labrie was one of those quiet leaders, you know, at six, losing six, one or winning six, one, this guy would block shots in the penalty kill, like no defense I've ever coached at this level. So, um, you know, there was a number of guys that uh, just were, were great human beings around and, and, and real good, people for our, our young kids to learn from. Awesome. You're speaking of young kids. One, did you see Igor Sokolov leading your team in scoring? And is he one <laughs> of the most fun people you've had? We had him on the show. We believe he's now maybe our favorite hockey player we've ever interviewed of all time. <laughs> yeah, he, he's, he's, he's a piece of work. This kid, uh, I would say after the first two weeks, no, you know, because I watched him play the first four games against Laval and, his game was just so methodical. I mean, you could tell that the, the, the hamster was spinning, right? Trying to figure out the systematic play and just the league in general. But, uh, you know, he, uh, he loves the game of hockey. And, you know, he watched every shift that he played this year with Ben Sexton. And um, I can't say enough of how much he just wants to get better. And I think as a coach, you know, that's what you want with, you know, you want these kids to meet you halfway and, uh, he's one of those people. And, um, you know, to just to see the improvement from, from week to week. And once he got that first goal, I mean, his, his shot is fantastic. I mean, it's NHL caliber already, you know, yeah. just a matter of him getting up to speed with the rest of his game uh, in terms of the time and space that disappears, you know, from the American league to the NHL. And um, he's certainly going to have a bright future and, uh, is, is going to play in the NHL at some point. And there's no doubt about it because he's just so motivated to get better. Who's the most I'm weird question? Who's the, your favorite player you've ever coached? <laughs> Put wow. him on the spot. <laughs> wow. Oh, gee, you know, I, there's been a lot. Uh, I, I might have to say Hubie Labrie. Ah. This guy is, you know, uh, when I found out he signed in the DEL, like I just, I like those players that, have to work for everything they get, you know, and he started in the ECHL and he's low maintenance and uh, just a real fun guy. When you get to know him, he's grumpy in the morning and, but <laughs> a little bit of that old school mentality. And uh, I can't say enough about that kid, but um, I, I know I'm leaving a few guys out, but, uh, yeah. but he's probably, you know, when I, his name came up going into my second year in Belleville as a potential guy that would, be a fit in Belleville. I, you know, I had him in Hershey for parts of three seasons. Uh, to me, it was a no brainer uh, that he was going to be, um, he was going to allow the culture here in, in Belleville to develop and uh, with a no nonsense approach and work ethic and uh, you know, every just put it on the line and practice kind of guy, you know, and you can't, you can't have enough of those guys. Cause that's how you win in my opinion. So how do you, when you coach, Wins can't be what you're looking for because you lose all your best players all the time. How do you judge a <laughs> successful season when you're seeing, you know, you could have Drake Batherson and you could have all these guys in your lineup and they're all playing in, in Ottawa, which is what you're supposed to do. So how, what's an AHL coach's successful season? Well, I, you know, I think, you know, that's a, that's an interesting one because, you know, I, I, I've only worked for two organizations. I guess at this stage of my career, it's probably a good thing for, for now. Um, and, and the mentality with Hershey and Washington was you got to win. You know, you got to win at the American Hockey League level and, and, and you got to develop as well. And so they, they preach both those. But deep down as a coach, if you don't win in Hershey, like you're not going to last there for forever. Uh, the mentality um, is probably a little bit different with the Sens just because in, you know, well, quite frankly, the budget is not as, as deep uh, in Belleville as it would be in Hershey. I mean, uh, so, you know, coming in that it's about getting players to the NHL, but make no mistake about it. We talk about playoffs and we talk about Calder Cup 
from day one because it's only fair to the veteran players that maybe are only playing a few NHL games or maybe not even seeing any NHL games that you are talking about that. And to me, winning in the American League, uh, you know, helps the NHL club down the line. And, um, you know, we went to the Calder Cup final in 2016 with Hershey and lost to Cleveland. You know, you look at those two teams that went to the finals, a lot of them are in the NHL, you know, eight or nine guys from each of that team. And, you know, next thing you know, the Washington Capitals win the Stanley Cup in 2018. And there was a number of players on that roster that at least experienced winning to the Calder Cup final. You know, they may not have won the Calder Cup, but they got to the finals and experienced what it takes to win and the highs and lows that go through long playoff runs. So I think it's uh, very, very important. And um, we've had some good teams here in Belleville the last couple of years. It's a, it's a shame that uh, we haven't been able to experience playoffs because it's something out of our control. Uh, but I do think it's very, very important, even though deep down, we know it's about getting Sokoloff and Thompson and these type of players to the NHL as soon as possible. Then are you like a proud dad when you see all these guys being successful at the NHL level? Yeah, I think you have to, right? Just knowing that you're doing your job, right? And, um, you know, there's no perfect player out there and they, they all make it on their own time frame. But when they do, you know, and they stick, um, it, it's proud moments because you feel that the work, the hard work you've put in and, and riding the buses and uh, just the amount of time that goes into coaching nowadays that a lot of people don't even realize uh, that's, that's what the reward is. And, um, you know, we, we've had some success here in Belleville getting guys to Ottawa. And I think we're starting to see uh, that come to light up there with, you know, how exciting the team was last year. And let's face it, the majority of the, the fun and, and the winning was coming with the young guys doing the work. Hmm. Uh, one last question before we move on to, I want to talk to you about your coaching history and that. So this question is, I've always wanted to ask the AHL is supposed to, when the player comes up, know exactly how the NHL system works. So do you have to change your style every time a new head coach comes in at the NHL level? For me, it just depends on the, the coach. You know, when I was in uh, Hershey, uh, Barry Trotz and I came in at the same time and he wanted us to play identical to the Washington Capitals. And, and we did. Uh, when I got the job in, in Belleville, uh, Guy Boucher, well, he barely talked to me, but other than that, uh, he, he didn't, he, he didn't say one thing about how we wanted to play in, uh, in Belleville, uh, DJ and I are, 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 are on the same page, right? I mean, there's always going to be tweaks, uh, because you have to have your own style, but except for a couple minor things, we play identical or we attempt to play identical to the sense, specifically five on five. I think power play and PK uh, is based on your talent level and, and what style of team you're having. But overall, uh, five on five, I think it's important, in my opinion, to match as close as possible to the, uh, the NHL club. And, and DJ and I are on uh, you know, the same page on probably... 80% of how we play. Coach, and, and the game is different to a degree, right? Because your personnel is not maybe as polished. When I was playing in Ottawa, I got sent down. Like, this is my first game back playing the American League, just on a rehab thing. And I was lost. Like, I was an yeah. established NHL player playing down in Binghamton for just one or two games. And I had no idea where I was going out on the ice, but it was so fast and a little more chaotic. Would you agree with that? Like, there's, there are some differences, obviously, in the system. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the positional play, as you know, is, is, it's just the guys don't get to their spots as quick as the NHL guys. And yeah, uh, so that makes, if we're playing the same four check as, as Ottawa, sometimes our guys are in the I, I, ideal position to execute that four check where in the NHL, you know, they're right on the money, you know, so yeah. sometimes it looks different. Right. And uh, the same as the neutral zone. Some guys don't figure out the neutral zone as quick as others, right? And, geez, we still had guys at game 32 asking questions about the neutral zone where, <laughs> NHL, you know, once they get that neutral zone down, I mean, obviously you still have to, you know, go over video and, and, and reminders yeah. for guys. But, uh, you know, the hockey IQ is, is, is better. It's the NHL, right? So it's, it's almost like it's more difficult for a coach down there, right? Because you guys have to have so much patience with these guys. Like, they're pros but they're still so green and you have to like 
have patience with the process that, that they'll eventually get it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the thing I even noticed at the AHL level, uh, you know, my teams in Hershey were a little bit on the older side where... Uh, yeah, well, Hershey's always like an all-star team in the A, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, so it's like uh, when you come to Belleville, specifically the second year where that influx of, of prospects came, we were, you know, we were tied with San Jose for the second youngest team in the league. Now this year with COVID, wow. uh, we didn't run the numbers, but I'd have to think we were the youngest team in the league with the amount of 19 and 20 year olds we had. So um, the first part, uh, and David Bell was great. You know, he spent a number of years coaching in the OHL and I've never coached in the OHL. So he had that feel for uh, the, the, the junior, you know, the, and the coach said all the time, get the junior out of the kid. Right. <laughs> so we just had to be patient. Right. And specifically me who, ultimately let's face it like the, the win loss record it's mine like you can talk about uh yeah well get this player to the nhl or get this player when someone looks up troy man's resume the wins and losses are, are mine right so yeah you have to balance that quite a bit and uh we've we're just with the amount of prospects coming through the pipeline right now we're just a really really young team and uh but it's fun to work with that type that age group uh, your brother is Trent Mann, of those who don't know, and he's the, the chief scout for the Ottawa Senators. So he's in charge of getting your players. So at, at any time, like at a Christmas dinner, have you ever said, what were you thinking with this player? <laughs> well, you know, we do chirp each other quite a bit. Um, and there's been s s individual chirps or even, you know, we, we have a number of different text strands going where, you know, if, if a particular prospect maybe doesn't perform in a certain night, I may throw a jab his way, you know, uh, overall, I, I think him and his staff have done a tremendous job. And one of the things that was very, very enticing about joining the Sens was I thought it'd be really cool to, to, you know, be able to coach some of these uh, draft picks that him and his staff had put together and, um, and, and trusting the process, right. Knowing that, you know, the guy that ultimately is in charge of the draft is, is someone I fully trust and, and respect in the hockey world. So, you know, that a lot of the prospects will hopefully be good, but uh, they're <laughs> in the odd chirp, I, I just threw one out the other day, actually at the end of the season uh, on a particular player. And uh, you know, so he's very, let's just say he's very, very protective of his draft picks. <laughs> I was going to say, is he a little sensitive? Like, and it comes back the other way. Like, what are you doing with this guy and why isn't he performing better? <laughs> yeah. There's the odd chirp on that as well. Um, about uh, certain guys, you know, maybe uh, he doesn't complain about ice time at all, though. So that's a good thing <laughs> with other people within the organization. But uh, that hasn't come back quite yet. Uh, I, one question you've coached. I think you coached four years in Hershey. How much chocolate did you eat in Hershey? <laughs> you, know, you get so sick of people giving you free chocolate that, um, you know, you, you don't even think about it anymore. It's like one of those things where, when you move to the U.S., you kind of forget about all these great Canadian treats we have up here, right? And then you come back and you just go crazy, you know, like Harvey's, for example. I love Harvey's. And when I'm in the U.S., one of the first stops I make when I cross the border is Harvey's. Well, now it's just, it's a normal thing, right? So it's kind of pretty much with the chocolate. And they, they got these huge chocolate bars that are like massive uh, that they hand <laughs> gifts. Um, so it's... Uh, but it's kind of cool when you're driving through Hershey in the summer with the window down, you can smell the chocolate, you know, in the town. So uh, it, it's a great little town. Uh, our family loved being there. And, you know, eight years is a long time as a coach. Uh, and just, a, you know, a little bit like Belleville, where it's a small community and it's really good for young families, right? And, you know, Belleville, small blue collar town. Uh, but when you've got a 13 year old daughter and a wife that grew up in a small town, Michigan, you know, those type of towns are, are great to live in. And uh, people just underestimate that, I think. So did you go and make your own chocolate bar at the factory? We did do the tour. There is a specific tour there. Um, you know, you get all that stuff out of the way when you first move there. And then it just becomes a, uh, you know, something that you don't even attend anymore unless you got family coming in. And then, uh, the family, oh, we got to go make that chocolate bar. We got to go make the chocolate so you cart them into the Hershey factory to so they can make their own chocolate bar and those those type of things definitely go on. But it's more when the uh, the tours uh, people come in and your uh, your family wants to you know get in there. Otherwise, you're kind of staying away from all the uh, uh, the tourist attractions that you know. And they they attract so many people in the summer there. 
it's uh, it's crazy times there, probably from May right through till Labor Day weekend. It's a beautiful area because I, I did take the, the family there one time to the Hershey Park. And Matthew will have to go because going through the chocolate factory is actually kind of neat. Um, what do you where do you keep your Stanley Cup ring that you got with Washington? I, if I'm not, you did get one, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I, I did get one. Uh, and it's uh, it's in the safe at home. It's uh, it's one of those things, as you know, like they, they get so big now. And ours uh, was not quite as big as the, uh, the play, NHL players that got them or the first you know, whatever, first 30 people or uh, I don't even know how they do it, but uh, we got the secondary one, but it's still massive, you know. So hey, it's obviously a proud accomplishment when you, uh, you know, see prospects playing and raising the cup. And um, it was it was fantastic to see that um, just because at the end of the day, when you're in the American League and your NHL club wins the Stanley Cup, you, you want to be recognized for the work you've done. And it uh, when you've been there, when I was there eight years and, you know, that's you know, I, I coached John Carlson, you know, who raised the cup. And I also coached Travis Boyd as the head coach who raised the cup, you know, so there was one extreme to the other uh, in terms of being the assistant and the head. So uh, there was, I think, 14 players on that NHL roster that I had coached in some capacity, whether it was the D coach or uh, as the head coach over my time there. Which is fantastic. And, and there was a part mm -hmm. where you left and came back because you wanted to be head coach and you went to, uh, Bakersfield, I think it's Bakersfield. I could be wrong. Yes, yes. Um, what did you learn about yourself in that one season? Because you had a successful year when you did that one move for one year. And how, well, I guess, were you hurt the first time you got passed over for being head coach with Hershey? Yeah, I was devastated after, you know, the there comes a point in your coaching career when you're an assistant at whatever level, you, you feel it's time that you're ready. And, um, you know, we had a good four-year run there and they, they had moved on from the, the head coach, Mark French, uh, and I felt that uh, I was ready, but, uh, you know, they wanted more experience at the head coaching position uh, with specifically AHL. And, uh, you know, I interviewed and I thought I did a good job, but it wasn't in the cards. And um, I remember talking to some people and said, hey, Troy, you've got to be a head coach now. And so I figured if Hershey and Washington were going to hire me, it was going to be pretty hard to get another AHL head coaching gig. So, uh, I took my chances and uh, went out to California for the year. And uh, I really thought at one point it might've been coaching suicide that, you know, if I didn't have success out there, uh, that was it for me. You know, how was I going to get to the back to the American league or even the NHL? So uh, I learned a lot about perseverance that year because that was one heck of a move uh, picking up the, the family and everything you own and, and go out to California. And then quite frankly, 11 months later, move right back to the same yeah. <laughs> because the guy they hired instead of you didn't really do a great job and they weren't bringing him back. And uh, ultimately the job went to you. So um, it was uh, perseverance was uh, probably the uh, real good word and patience uh, driving out uh, from uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania to Bakersfield, California in my wife's car and the dog. And I remember the plant in the back seat, I was trying to keep this one plant alive. <laughs> go in the truck and my wife loved this plant. And I remember pulling into, um, I think it was Topeka, Kansas, in it rains and the weather's miserable there at times, as you know, with the storms. And I remember checking into a hotel and I had the dog and I was trying to push the cart with my luggage. I had this stupid plant that I was trying to save <laughs> in California. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. The stories of the minor leagues, you can go on forever. Do you still have the plant? Uh, the plant did not make it. <laughs> to Hershey. My wife gave it to a neighbor down the street. She said, we are not bringing this back to Hershey. It may not. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you played in Bakersfield as well as coached it, and I'm curious, have you seen the Bakersfield Condor bird mascot? Uh, yes, I have. Yes, I have. Yes. I, I miss the, uh, the shenanigans with the bird on the ice with the gentleman falling down. Um, but they did bring the bird in my head coaching year um, with, I would say, a little bit better success than the one that's on YouTube that everybody's seen uh, from years back. But uh, I have witnessed that. It's a pretty cool thing, but uh, it's a difficult thing to manage to try to get this bird to settle down at center ice, that's for sure. <laughs> Are you like on pins and needles, like waiting yeah. to see what's going to happen with the bird? Yeah, you're sitting, you know, it's... <laughs> 
<laughs> chuckling and you're going, there's no way this is going to happen, right? Because in your mind, you're thinking, is this bird just going to take off and fly by the bench where we're all going to have to duck for cover? Um, it's quite the, uh, but I will say the one thing about out there is Bakersfield, they do a tremendous job. Uh, they're in game, uh, in game entertainment and how they promote the team is, uh, is second to none. So they, they're very creative and that's what you have to be in the minor leagues to get people through the uh, turnstiles. Coach, I, I wanted to ask you one question. I'm going to put you on the spot here. So forgive me if I embarrass you maybe a little bit. <laughs> Back in 99, when you were playing, you played about 31 games in the UHL that one year. Yeah. And your minus, what was your plus minus that year? Do you remember? Yeah, it was probably, I remember that team. It was, <laughs> I, you know what? I wasn't even the worst one on the team. I think, oh, I, no. <laughs> I, I think even, someone I was, that. I think there was someone that was like 62. It was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> minus 49. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I yeah, saw. It was, I saw that in 31 games. I'm like, that must have been a really tough team. Yeah, the, uh, the some of my teammates, because as coaches, you know, you preach defense, and you know, I was a centerman, and you know, obviously from my stats, I I, I was a decent offensive player that probably didn't give too much about deep deep home coverage. <laughs> plus minus. Now I will say it is an overrated stat because it's based on how good. I you agree. Play, you yeah, know, but you're the first guy to bring it up. Yeah, that's, that's always talking about the plus minus. only so it only when it anything. fits only when it suits me. That's why I bring yeah, it up. Anyway, yeah. I didn't, yeah, but it's it's uh you're right. It's that was a tough team. Uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons I went back to that area was because my my now wife was from the area and they had recruited me the summer before and I decided not to go. And then halfway through the year, I uh, wasn't working out with that team, so I said, you know what, I'm just going to go back to that team. And they weren't very good. Um uh, and. Uh, the points kept coming for me, but the minuses were piling up. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> don't, great. Yeah, guys don't, you know, guys will throw that out here and there. And I'm like, come on, you know, <laughs> yeah. an overrated stat. I'm more into analytics nowadays than the old plus minus stat. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> you played, uh, let's see if I can get this Saginaw, Mississippi, uh, Hampton, Tallahassee, Jackson, Bakersfield, Elmira. Cam Kalamazoo, San Angelo, Missouri, Topeka. Um, do you have all these jerseys? No, no. I have some of the jerseys, um, but I do still have my Topeka Tarantulas jersey. And that was that's amazing. Uh, I was transitioning to the to to coaching that year, so I only played I think three games. Or it was more to <laughs> another minor league story. I mean, the roster gets so short that someone has to play. So. <laughs> So, coaches could so you were you were a player coach? Yeah, player coach. <laughs> no way. You know, you get down. That's to, amazing. Yeah, you get down to eight, nine, four, and someone's got to play the games. Now, obviously, the rules have changed over the years, and man or coaches cannot play. But back then, you could. So, uh, but that was the year. I I think I was thirty five at the time, and um, I, I transitioned to. I was transitioning into the. I really wanted to get into coaching, and uh, that was the year. But I, I still got a chance to to put on the old skates a few games and, and got the Jersey for it. But uh, you know, back then, you know, you, you sometimes you tried to uh, you always tried to make one team, the perfect situation. So if you didn't like it, you said, you know what, I don't like it here. I don't like this coach. I don't want to play here. So I'm out. Let's, let's move on. And you could, you had that ability back then uh, to try and find the right fit, you know, where nowadays it's, mm. you have a little to tougher now. Yeah. It's much tougher now. I don't want to rub salt in the wounds. Eight games minus seven that year. <laughs> yeah, see that's, what an, I mean? that's an improvement. That's an improvement from the <laughs> that's other year. Improvement. <laughs> Positive the, thinking. Hey, if any of our players on the B sends are going to watch this, they're going to be all over me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That all we talked about was my plus minus. But uh, <laughs> what I tell the guys, hey, that's why I'm. I think I'm a good coach. I learned from uh, some of the bad stuff I was as a player. Right. So there you go. <laughs> What's your relationship with Bruce Boudreau and how does it play into you being a head coach? Yeah, Bruce, you know, he's a fantastic guy. And um, the reason I got into coaching, right. I, I met Bruce um, in 96 and I remember him uh, calling me when the summer, I, I thought it was a joke. Actually, he got my name from a guy he had coached in Fort Wayne of the old IHL. Bruce called me up. I remember it, it was in June and he said, 
Uh, you know, Troy, uh, this is Bruce Boudreau. Uh, I'm the head coach of the Mississippi Seawolves of the ECH. And I'm like, pardon me, Mississippi. I was like, whatever, <laughs> like, who's calling me, right? But uh, it was, a, you know, it was a, we had a great conversation. And he said, listen, Troy, like, I'm going to fly you down to Biloxi, Mississippi. I'm going to make you the first player ever signed by the organization. And I had come off a, you know, point of game in the old United League in Saginaw. And, uh, you know, he said, I'll, you know, I'll get, I'll get you a AHL training camp. So long story short, I ended up going down there and it was, you know, fantastic area. And Bruce was awesome. I, I thought he was the ultimate players coach and um, we won a, a Kelly cup together in 99. Uh, so I played with him for three years. He actually traded me and we kept the relationship so strong. He traded back for me. Uh, Cause usually when you get traded, there's usually some, some animosity amongst the coach player uh, but him and I stayed in good terms and he brought me back and we ended up winning the Cu uh, Kelly cup together. But um, he had asked me that last year, actually to, to be his assistant coach and looking back, you know, we all make mistakes over the, our, our years. And uh, I probably should have just packed it in there and got into coaching because, you know, Bruce has had a fantastic career, but I just love playing and be around the guys. And I had a degree from U of T. So I wasn't, you know, I was like, you know what, I'm going to keep playing because why not? Like I got my degree in my back pocket and, you know, coaching will be there down the line. So, uh, but he was the one that kind of gave me that inspiration and said, you know what, Troy, I think you'd make a good coach. So uh, it was from there that we, you know, even when he left for the American league, I think he went to Lowell with the LA Kings, we kept in touch. And uh, he was a, you know, obviously a, a, a big reason why I was able to get the opportunity in Hershey. Right. And uh, as we all know, that's how it happens in the NHL and American, right? It's about who, you know, and uh, those type of things. Uh, and that's, that's really how I ended up with Hershey was through him and, and Bob Woods, who was the uh, player assistant at that time and won a Kelly cup together. And Bob Woods and I are still great friends. Uh, and he's now in Minnesota as the assistant coach as well. You brought up analytics a second ago. How much do you rely on analytics? Of course, it, it's a hot button Ooh, issue. It seems so good question. What does the Belleville Senators do in relation to analytics, I guess? Yeah, we do a lot uh, over the years. Uh, it's certainly progressed. Um, you know, I would say when we I first started coaching the American League, we, we do chances for and against, uh, but there really wasn't any hard data. That was just all subjective from you and the, uh, the coaching staff. But now with sports logic, I like to use sports logic as a tool uh, for not only breaking down the opposition, but selling how you're playing as a team. So for mm. example, uh, we like to play with a really tight gap in Belleville and so does DJ and we call it the squeeze system and everybody has their different terminology for it. But, you know, we finished first in the American league this year. Again, last year we finished, I think it was second or fourth. So it's back to back years that we, according to sports logic, and it's not perfect science, we were at the top of the league in, in our gap control in terms of D zone entries and protecting blue line. So that is something you can put up on a board and show the players that what we are teaching is actually working because we're, you know, first in the American league or fourth in the American league. Right. Uh, so those are the type of things I like to use with analytics. Uh, and again, for looking at the strength and weaknesses of the opposition, you know, well, you know, what Syracuse, they're a heavy reverse breakout team. They like coming out the strong side. Well, the analytics may tell me that. So I don't have to spend hours and hours breaking down the Syracuse crunch. Um, you know, I, of course, you're going to break them down. But if the analytics tell me this is their strength and weaknesses, I can go straight to that video to put our pre-scout together and then base that on the analytics of what the strengths and weaknesses of the team are according to sports logic. So those are the type of things we like to do. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, with so much emphasis on trying to create offensive zone play and offensive zone time and high danger shots. Uh, we certainly use that as a, uh, an area to improve our team or get guys to go to certain areas based on the analytics. Coach, how do you measure that? Uh, you, you caught me there at the beginning with those D zone entries, you guys talking about the squeeze or in the good gap, which that's, yes. by the way, I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, how does that get measured in games? Is there someone in the stands or like your video coach keeping track and just ticking them off? So the sports logic. So every NHL team has an opportunity to sign up with sports logic and you pay X amount of dollars. And the packages range from 70,000 to maybe 
I'm going to say 120,000 a year and each wow. can, can buy their own package. I believe now sports logic pro, I think they may have 29 or 30 teams signed up now. Um, and actually Ottawa was one of the last teams to sign up. And I know that because when I got hired, um, I was out in Vancouver for the draft and DJ and I sat down with sports logic because they did a presentation to management and Pierre Doriel wanted DJ and I there. Um, so we were asking specific questions pertaining to coaching and they were showing all the ways to do it. So they actually do it for you. And then you get the 24 hours later, you get the, the, the summary of the game and you can wow. on an individual game basis where the, where you were strong and where you were weak. Now, again, it's not perfect because uh, the one area I like to compare with sports logic on a game to game basis is the scoring chances for and against and my, our video coach still does that, right, with our goalie coach. And Justin Peters sits down with uh, Freddie LeMay every morning after the game, and they go out over every chance for and against that they've marked. And then we compare it to sports logic to see how close it is. But yeah. you can really judge your team when you start getting to that 10, 15, 20 goal mark, because then you can see all 31 teams from the American League on, okay, where are you on D-zone entries? You know, where are you on breakouts? You know, where are you in these categories? And then you can base your strength and weaknesses on that. And I'll be honest with you, like, and I look at our team, our, our team in Belvo the last two years, it, it's pretty accurate. If I give you my, our strength and weaknesses of what I think the Belleville centers are, sports logic is actually pretty close in terms of determining your strength and weaknesses. So I just think it's a fantastic tool uh, to evaluate. It's not, you know, it's not perfect. And you still got a coach and you still got that feel of the game. And um, mm. I think it's a, what I like to say, an added tool to make you a better coach. Yeah. And, and so uh, that's awesome. I had no idea that that was the way it worked with sports logic. So you guys have a third party system that reviews all the games. And within that time frame, you guys get all that information back. Yes, and like so, D so, sorry, go ahead. There, say like DJ, like the NHL teams get it even quicker than the American league team. Like DJ after the game within hours, he can have the breakdown from sports logic of the game against the Leafs. So he knows exactly what's going on now. I believe oh. it's four hours for the American league. So ours is a little bit more delayed. Uh, yeah. It's still a, a fantastic tool uh, to use. So you got, you talk about that D squeeze where you're trying to maintain good gap. And I know you probably don't want to give up a whole lot. I just, again, fascinated with this stuff i love hearing about systems how do you guys just rely on like a high third band like like good back pressure from the from the from the forwards to allow the d to step to step up more is that how it works yeah absolutely and everybody has their different rules like and, and the american league i just working with dj and, and barry trotz and bruce Boudreau, you, you got to take the gray like the nhl i think not that you want any gray area as you know but again the players are better smarter in the american league to me, you have to have set rules. So our set yeah. is basically the red line. If the forward can push the puck carrier to the red line, he's got the green light. If he cannot catch him by the red line and the puck is kicked out, it's an automatic shift. I call it the squeeze. And then the F3 just continues down the middle of the ice and picks up anything wide. Uh, and that allows there's no gray area, right? The D know that if, if the forward doesn't have him by the red line and that, center, yeah. that middle ice presence kicks it out, the D are shifting, the, the weak side D is taking any drivers, and then, you know, three, four, and five have to pick up the rest. And yeah. I have found over the years in the American League uh, that the red line allows for players to have, okay, I know what I need to do from the red line in based on where the puck is going, based where the forward is, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. In it's like a little half, coach's clinic. Yeah, <laughs> in the yeah. second hour of the interview, we're going to have a whiteboard. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I just I had just to know. Kidding. Legit, no, no, I just say, I great. wanted to know this. Yeah, yeah I love cool. talking about that stuff. It's 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 a lot of fun just to talk hockey and talk systems and what works, what doesn't work, what certain teams like. You know, it's uh, it's all it's, yeah. it's, it's for great banter. Yeah. Okay, so can you tell us who your uh, best analytics player is? Uh, last year, our best analytics player, I believe, was Josh Norris. Um, mm. actually, and just another, like Michael Carcone, uh, who was you know, traded in the off season was another analytics, like his, he was top three in a lot of categories, but he's not with the organization anymore for specific reasons. So 
even though your analytics may be great, you, you know, it, it's the human element of being coachable and viewing the right things and being yeah. a team concept. There's a lot more that goes into it, right? So you've got to really uh, balance it, right? So I would say last year, our top three was probably, you know, Norris, Batherson, and Michael Carcone. You know, Michael Carcone moved on to another organization and obviously Norris and Batherson are full-time NHLers. So, uh, so that's, you know, certainly um, t- speaks a lot, but not the whole picture. Yeah. And, and you, do you think Norris is Norris a true number one? You think like, like I've always, I've got his back every time I have this argument with people, I think he's a true number one center because he's so good both ways, not just offensively. What are your thoughts on all that and where he sits right now on that depth chart? Well, I, I think if you spoke to me this time last year and, and what we do here in Belleville at the end of each year, we put a, what we call a roster recommendations together and we go through every player whether they're on AHL deal, NHL, doesn't matter, and say, okay, we, we see this player being, you know, part of it or in the NHL in two years or – and it's obviously prediction. Um, and and our, our quote on Norris was, if he puts the work in in the summer, he will be yeah. in the NHL next year. And I thought that if he could end up being a number two center, then the, that was going to be golden for the Ottawa Senators – and, you know, I, I think that overall he's, he's proved even more of that uh, based on, on the, this season, right, which is fantastic, right? But you're right, like the kid is so detailed and wanting to be great at both ends of the rink. It just makes him, um, you know, a fabulous guy to, to be able to build your team around in the middle ice position, right? So yeah. um, it, it's a great debate, and I, I, yeah. I want to – from the coaching side of it, I'd like to see more of a sample size to say right. be a one, but I think he's a hundred percent proved he's definitely a two uh, yeah. on what he was able to accomplish last year. And uh, when you talk about players meeting coaches 50% of the way, uh, this is what Josh Norris is about. Right. And that's why he's going to be so good because he's not sitting at home right now. Uh, you know, thinking, Oh man, I had a great season in the NHL. Like he's working to be even better come September and that's what I loved about him uh and coaching uh him last year or two years ago now uh you coached against the the north obviously and and the NHL teams did the same as they played each other so were you surprised to see the Leafs beat the Habs or sorry the Habs beat the Leafs in seven games no uh not no only because I I just felt that Carey Price was the x factor and you know as a coach, I've been through a lot of goaltenders over the years and it just, you know, coaches joke all the time about goalies make or break in their coaching career. And it's true, right? Like, uh, so as much as I um, thought the Leafs were the better team and quite frankly, preferred the way the Leafs played the game in terms of that puck possession style of of hockey and uh, using your talent, I, I didn't think the Leafs, got to the blue paint enough. And, and, and the other thing I did, yeah. least did enough of, and I call it possession versus pursuit. And um, it's, 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 it's terminology that Mike Sullivan uses uh, with the Pittsburgh Penguins a lot is possession. Yeah. Like I tell our guys all the time, we want to enter with possession, but if they give you the line, you take the line. Cause ultimately it, the analytics show that if you enter with possession, you got a better chance of scoring But if teams are playing with great gap and they're stepping up and they got great back pressure, you've got to put pucks to space. And I don't call it a four check. I call it, you know, let's pursue the puck. Let's put it into great areas of the ice so we can get the puck back. So I talk a lot about possession versus pursuit. And I just felt that the Leafs over the course of the series were way too stubborn. And I tell our players all the time, why are we being stubborn at the blue line? Like they're not giving us the line. Like at some point we need possession. So the least possession time was not as high for me because they weren't putting pucks to space and using that great speed to be able to have possession in the OZP. And ultimately, Mm -hmm. you know, if you look at Marner's turnover on that one goal, to me that exemplified how they played those last three games where they just were too stubborn at the blue line and quite frankly, didn't get to the blue paint enough. And when they did, Carey Price was there because he's just fantastic in those moments. So who wins the next round? Montreal or Winnipeg? 
I'm going to say Winnipeg. I really like Winnipeg's depth. I like their top nine. I love their center ice position. I think they have an underrated defense that plays hard. And I think uh, I'm a big, big fan of Hellebuck and Net. So I yeah. think match Carey Price. So I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with uh, Winnipeg. Yeah. What's what kind of uh, toll does that seven game series take as a team compared to a, a Winnipeg team that's been sitting rested? They should have probably healed up. Like, does that get overlooked, or is are they running on adrenaline and momentum going into the seven games? Or well, I the think they're. Series? I, I certainly think they're, they're, there's adrenaline, but I think in this particular season, and I know the NHL schedule. You know, Barry Trotz has always said to me. He says, Troy, there's two things that's different from being a head coach in the American League to the NHL. One, you got to deal with players making eight million dollars, and two is a schedule. Like, there's always like a mental break in the AHL schedule. If it's Sunday or Monday, you get to take a deep breath, even though you're playing three games that week. Where the NHL, it's like every other night. Well, for me, it seemed to be like you know these crazy schedules where NHL teams were playing X amount of games in a short period of time. So. I think much like the Colorado game the other night, uh, I think that the rest is doing teams probably a more better factor this year than maybe in past years. Sure. Uh, and last question. We got maybe I'll have to, I never seem to be able to count properly is, <laughs> is Troy man ready for the NHL? I believe so. I don't think personally, I don't think there's anything left to prove at this level. Um, you know, I've been a head coach for seven years now. I had a lot of success. I've been to the Calder Cup final coaching. I've, you know, there was a number of prospects that won the Stanley Cup in Washington. I think I'm, you know, my, my staff and I are doing the job here in Ottawa. So um, I, I love coaching the American League and I love being a head coach. So it's a matter of opportunity and the right opportunity, whether that's being a head coach or an assistant coach. Um, so, you know, I, I am being patient, but if someone asks me if I'm ready for that next step, I, I think. 11 years in the American league as an assistant and a, and a head is, is, is paying the dues. And if it has to go longer, it has to go longer. I'm not, I'm not afraid to coach in the American league because I just, I, I love the fact that you're able to, um, you know, just get energized with these young kids coming in because they want to learn and they want to get better. And um, you know, my time in Belleville has been fantastic because we've had some, some real good people come through the doors as players. Uh, before we go, it's a question we ask everybody, if I don't forget, and that is, uh, you brought up about eating a lot of Hershey chocolate and about Harvey's. What is your favorite snack to sit on the couch and watch a movie with? Yeah, I'm a big chip guy. So <laughs> no I, hesitation, I, right to yeah, the chips. chips. Chips are my crutch, like all dress, ketchup, you know, like, uh, I just seen that Lays came out with a new, uh, all dress to, to try and uh, <laughs> the ruffles all dress. So um, and I say that, and I know my staff are, if they watch this podcast, are going to be laughing because we watched hockey every night at the Brick Street this year. Uh, it was fantastic. I mean, we were away from our families, but they gave us a coach's room and we called it the coach's office in the afternoons when we worked and the lounge at night. And we go down there and we put a hockey game on specifically the North division uh, on the big screen. And we'd sit there and whether it was, waters diet cokes maybe the odd beer uh there was a lot of chips eaten uh by a lot of guys but specifically me where when i start i can't stop so i'm trying to be much better since i got home uh because i ate a lot of chips up at the brook street watching hockey it's true <laughs> though once you start it's it's tough to stop you're like i'm just gonna put the bag down and i'm gonna leave it that's never the case you're like no i'm gonna have another one um mm -hmm. Is you mentioned all dressed in ketchup because is that two that you couldn't get in the U.S.? Yeah, um, spe specifically ketchup chips are very very rare in the U.S. All dressed, it, it was coming into it when we left there, uh, but I I just think the treats and the, the the types of chips we have in Canada, the U.S. is no match for those type of things. I, I'm I'm impressed at how well you're able to stay in shape with all the stuff around <laughs> that you're enjoying all the time. <laughs> uh, Troy, man, we appreciate your time. Good luck uh, next season. We hope to see you behind an NHL bench very soon, my friend. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's always a pleasure to talk hockey. It's, thanks for having me on. Right Enjoy on. your Thanks, yourself. Coach. Good luck. Thanks.
Welcome back to the Wally Matha Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. Check out their all-new lineup of custom vehicles at barhavenford.com slash bfc dash customs. Okay, Meth, time for On the Points. Brought to you by sportsinteraction.com slash Wally and Mathot. Sports Interaction is Canada's odds makers. Head over to sportsinteraction.com slash Wally Mathot today to get in on the action. Uh, quickly before we begin, so I signed up for the account and I had 20 bucks in my account. I put 10 bucks on, uh, you pick all four winners of the playoffs over the two nights or whatever it was. I won 200 bucks. Nice. Yeah. Well $214. I'm like, what? Really? Anyway, um, I had no idea what I was doing. So that's how easy it is. <laughs> Uh, game two predictions. Let's go Montreal, Winnipeg, game two. God, I don't even know what the lineup is going to look like. Do the Winnipeg Jets even up this series? If Winnipeg is rolling and they're healthy and they have Shifley back in that lineup, then I'm inclined to go with them. But quite frankly, I, I feel like he's, we talked about it. I don't want to get yeah. into it. I feel like he's going to get suspended. And Montreal, uh, they, if, if they can win that first game in Winnipeg, then they can win that second game. So right now with the momentum they're rolling, how do you bet against that? I'm going to go with Montreal just for fun here. And I think it's going to be a close game. It'll be a 3-2 or a 4-2 type game. And I'm, I, I've got to go with them as my winner. I'm going to go with the fired up and pissed off Winnipeg Jets who now, depending on whatever happens, are just going to be like, okay, this isn't going to happen to us. Paul Maurice is going to come in and say something. Uh, Winnipeg will win this one in overtime. Uh, three two, Ooh, and like that. Uh, let me get your series winner. My series winner. Well, I'm gonna. I'm going with Montreal at this point. I'm gonna oh, have so you waver like crazy. Well, I have to. Like, I can. I can. I can stick to my original Winnipeg prediction before the series. But just from watching Montreal now, I mean, I, I just. I think they're gonna win. I really do. And I think now, depending on what happens, Stastny's gone. Shifley's not potentially might miss a game that gives another leg up for Montreal. And I just, now that I've watched Winnipeg play and, and their yeah. decor, I just, that decor is going to really hurt them. I'm telling you. And, and, and Hellebuck has to be like literally lights out in order to get this win for this, for this group. So I I'm sticking with Montreal. I like their decor more. Their forwards look more engaged. Their young guns are rolling and playing really well. And Carey Price is looking awesome. How do you bet against Carey Price? Well, because Connor Hellebuck's a Vesna finalist. I, uh, I, or, I know. Sorry, Vesna winner. So that's the only reason. I, I mean, I know they're two good goalies, so it could go yep. either way. But yep. And I've seen Connor Hellebuck come into Ottawa this year and look atrocious. So you can get that, but I'm just going to stick with... Sounds uh, good. I'm going to go with them. Just they're it'll be ornery, and so they're not going to try and go down here 2-0. Uh, all right, Carolina-Tampa game three. Does Tampa put the stranglehold on this one, or can Carolina... Claw, claw back into this and make it a 2-1 series. No, no. Tampa's got this. And Tampa's, Tampa had this series before it started. If you've oh, been paying on. attention, if anybody's been paying attention to Tampa Bay, which I know a lot of the, the chatter has been surrounding the avalanche, but if you've been watching the Tampa Bay Lightning play, they look good. And so, I mean, I don't care who you are. Well, I shouldn't say this because there is always a chance, as we know. We've seen it now with Montreal and Toronto. But, um, yeah, Tampa, to me, they're just too strong. They're too deep. They're very well-rounded, incredible goaltending, very good decor, dangerous forwards. It's almost unfair. Uh, I really do hope we see a Tampa-Colorado final. To me, that would be awesome. Uh, but that's wishful thinking. We'll see. But uh, for sure, Tampa Bay. All right. I, I'll take Tampa, although something tells me it's going to be a Carolina win just because it's so Good. hard. Once yeah. you get up, right, it's almost like an elimination game for them. If Carolina loses tonight, it's lights out, right? So yeah, you just sense then, that elim it's yeah. like an elimination factor. It plays uh, and it's a mental thing. When you're on the brink yeah. sometimes, some players can cower away and they think, okay, I'm done. Like, I, we can't win this. I know it's harsh. People don't want to believe that, but it can creep into your room. So if you are in Carolina, your leaders have to step up and you have to voice that and you have to get everybody motivated because it's not going to be an easy claw back into that series. Well, it reminds me of when Daniel Albertson was asked about winning the series. Like, uh, can you guys come back? And he's like, nah, not really. So that was yeah, a little I, harsh. Alfie was probably a little frustrated, maybe a little too honest. <laughs> yeah, well, that was always the thing, right? It just, he, yeah, he said it, but like, did he just really say that? Yeah. Anyway. Um, all right. It'd be interesting to see how this all plays out. So those are the picks now make yours at sportsinteraction.com slash Wally Mathot sports interaction, Canada's online sports, but course those odds subject to change.
Welcome back to the Wally Thought Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. They're the first and only dealership in Ottawa to feature Roush-inspired custom builds. Go to barhavenford.com slash bfc customs. Okay, Matt. So one thing I left out in the earlier chat about the lease was all the attention and vile vitriol on Twitter, on social media about Mitch Marner. And so I want to now discuss the keyboard warriors presented by Faces Magazine. Check out the latest issue and updated articles at facesmag.ca. You're a player. Now, I know you're used to taking all kinds of crap online. So on, on, when I see the stuff about Mitch Marner in particular, and I know there's others and it's about all the Leafs, like it bothers me. And I, and I probably am too soft. There has to be a line on social media where you can't just go after people because you're upset they lost at a sporting event. Yeah, I know. It, it really is brutal. And that's the unfortunate side effect of, you know, social media and not being held accountable for your words with anonymous accounts. And the same applies for, you know, anything political that you're reading in this landscape today. It's, it's pretty hard. So what do you do when it comes to sports? Uh, there's nothing you can do. I think the only thing you can, if you're a player, and I think Marner alluded to it, which was unfortunate, but he had to do it was delete his social media. And so, you know, fan bases are going to be very passionate and you have to respect that. I mean, they, they, they're the ones that basically and essentially pay you as a player. And so if you're not, if you don't want to hear it, you don't want to be exposed to it, then don't sign up for it. And when I say that, I mean, don't have a Twitter account, stay off Instagram or turn off the comments and just move on with your day. When you're getting paid 10 plus million dollars and you're not performing in the postseason, well, what, what do you think happens? People are going to be very critical of your play. And that comes with that. So you sign that deal you took on that responsibility. Does that mean that it can be personal attacks? No. You'll never be able to hold those people accountable because they're all anonymous accounts. Close down your Twitter, close down your Instagram, and just move on with your day. But that's not fair to all the fans who want to engage with the athlete and the athlete who wants to engage directly with the fan base. This is completely out of control where you get just you just get to say crap. Listen, if I right. showed up at... Jimmy at 4227 and showed up at his work and told him how crappy he was at his job. Do you think that would be allowed? No. no so just no. because you play a sport and you make a lot of money doesn't give you the right to go after somebody no. and attack them. Like I, but Wally, I know that I'm there not has to be some recourse and I know you're not defending that. I'm just no. like, where is the recourse for any of these things to happen other than suspending an account and you just make a new one? Well, you it's, you make, so you make the con the, you make that conscious decision to sign up for Twitter and engage with Vans. Now, what, what I'd say at least, let's say one out of 10 people on there is an, is an incredibly unhappy person that's going to go out of their way all the time to be negative. Generally speaking, if you get some nasty messages, you, all you have to do is go onto their profile and go through their, their tweets or history, and you'll see that there's almost no positive stuff in there. So you have to understand who's coming at you. It's not some normal level-headed person. It's an incredibly unhappy person. And so... You know, you're going to you mix that in with a little bit of passion towards their local team. They're going to be angry and they're going to get personal sometimes. I've dealt with it. It's, it's not. Fun. All right. But we are trying to, as a society to be better mentally. Right. And to treat better people with much more respect and to, and to deal with mental health. Right. And, and so yeah, but here, you're, that's hearing, assuming everybody's intelligent and I, has that frame of mind. I know. You know I just can there, there not be a there? Twitter test then you have to have some kind of aptitude to be on social okay. media Look, like. Look, I know it's a ridiculous statement to make, but I'm I'm so disappointed in that people just get to go after people and attack them for not putting a vulcanized rubber disc into a net. It has no bearing on their life whatsoever. I know, but Wally, I, I'm just going to keep going back to my original point. It's like, there's just a lot of stupid people out there. I was in traffic a couple of weeks ago and there was a guy in a pickup truck and it was at a stop. And he threw his pack, like, like an empty pack of cigarettes out his window onto the, onto the pavement, right in front of me. So I got out of the car. I walked over to his empty pack of cigarettes. My wife was, my wife was with me and I gave it to him. I picked it up. We're, 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 like it was out in the middle of nowhere, but I picked up the empty pack of cigarettes and I put it back in his truck and he, did, he didn't even look at me and he just drove on. You're giving people too much credit here. No one thinks collectively that way. All the racism, all the sexism, uh, you know, the, the misogyny, all that stuff that we see online, these are just stupid people. 
So you'll never change their perspective or mind. You have to ignore them, block them, and get rid of them. That's all it but, is. But if you read a thousand tweets that say, you suck, you're the worst person in the world, sure. you should, like, does it not have an impact? Yeah, it does. For sure it does. But And you got to keep doing your part. You got to tell them that, that it isn't right. But again, I just, I sound like a broken record. Okay. You're not going to change a lot of these people's minds. They're just the way they are. They're not very smart. They're ignorant. And they're going to continue to do that because they're unhappy. And it's just the way she goes. So, so don't, I'm not saying to turn the other cheek and not address it. I'd love to address it. There's just so many people like that on there that you can't control them. When I first got my Twitter account, it was really early on. Someone sent a tweet at me like, I'd really like to punch you in the face. And so I went to their account and it said in their profile, like official Brent Wallace hater. And then I replied to him like, that's cool. And I'm like, what on earth would, how much anger do you have inside that you are mad at me? I Like you need to pick somebody better to hate on. I don't know why it would be me. Like I couldn't understand. I, I mean, like, if, if you wore a shirt like that every day, <laughs> I'd be hating on you as much as I could. Cause you seriously, wow. you look like you should be working for either Coca-Cola or Petro Canada. They're very good. You know what? I could use a job. It's like a bowling shirt. It, like it's a bolt. Like I, I can't figure out why you're wearing it. Like that was your, like you looked at that in the closet yeah. and you thought I nailed, this is perfect. This is going to look really good. This is the one. Yeah. Cause, cause I was <laughs> given this free. So yeah, of course I'm going to wear it. Um, you should see the ones I didn't put on. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the guy on Twitter, when I responded to him, he's like, Oh, I just wanted to get a reaction out of you. I'm like, this is the problem with social media. Anyway. Uh, no. We'll save it for another day. I just have Do a problem with, the trolls. with everybody that thinks that they have to have a comment or say something to a person that you wouldn't say to a friend of yours. That stuff just bothers me. So um, we'll probably address it again some other time. But that is taking a look and brought to you by Faces Magazine. Uh, lots of great stories, by the way, in the latest edition. And I saw a photo shoot yesterday recently with uh, Tom Green. Looks like he's going to be in the next issue. And nice. I think Sean Simpson, who you brought up earlier, might be in the July issue. Check that out. Faces right. Mag. Dot CA. All right, Craig. Uh, I know you're a big social media guy, so uh, I, like I'm going to even assume when you worked for the Sens, you probably took some heat from Twitter. Oh my God! It, like <laughs> <laughs> you have no, you have no idea. Like I lived in the replies and mentions for the three worst years the organization ever had. Like it was, you develop a very quick skin very quickly, and uh, um, I mean you just learn to ignore it and you learn like, like Matt said, like it doesn't mean anything, right. It's most people like that's their own, that's their release. That's the way they, they reach out and they do those things. So, I mean, they would personally, like I would get stuff about me on there and it just makes me laugh. Like it's, I get it. It's, it's the way we, uh, we, really, we can't, uh, it, it can't be the happiest place in the world all the time. I think it's kind of what you learn. My favorite thing though on Twitter is when people miss, uh, they mistake you for somebody else. And so like, Math people yell at you for doing something. You're like, that's not even me. So I've seen a lot of that where people think I'm like Ryan Rashog. They're like, I can't believe you said that. I'm like, that wasn't me. Anyway, that's one of my favorites. I might, I might um, mistake you for someone who works at the parts department at Canadian Tire with that shirt on. But hey, just... I spent, I worked at three different Canadian Tires. I was employed September 1990, by the way. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Just Plus maybe, maybe don't uh, bring the, uh, the. Like both of you have. I have t-shirts from your bedroom this floor is, on like tired. enough already. This is a quality is, yeah. Nike gong built show. shirt. This is a gong show one. So uh, <laughs> speaking of, do you want to know why I'm wearing this gong show one? Because it's trivial <laughs> trivia presented by gong uh, But before we get to that part, we, we do have a winner uh, to announce from our last show uh, and they will be receiving a free round of golf for four, including power cart rentals from our friends at uh, Edgewood links. Um, book your tea time today at Edgewood links. Dot com. And the question we asked at the time was, who was Nick Paul's first professional head coach? The answer, Luke Richardson, obviously now coaching uh, as an assistant in Montreal, but uh, he was uh, Nick Paul's coach in Binghamton for his first pro year. Uh, big shout out to at Jeremy Lockett 19, uh, who is going to score himself a free round of golf uh, for a couple buddies and some power carts at Edgewood. So keep an eye on those DMs and we're going to reach over really soon. I think. This trivia question got more people with the wrong answer than anything else. And the number of people that said Dave Cameron um, shocked me, actually. Yeah. Yeah. This is one where I had to look it up. I didn't know. I wasn't sure when he when he went pro, like if it was in the AHL, because I know he played some yeah. NHL games right away, too. So yeah, it's, it was hard to say. So, yeah, I guess. I checked. Richardson. Okay. Go I ahead. trust I you. <laughs> 
anyway, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for sure. So um, today uh, we got another Gong Show sauce off game to give away. Um, Father's Day is coming up. So if you do any, need any co cool things for your dad uh, or a dad in your life, uh, head on over to gongshow.com. Check it out. They got a bunch of hats. Uh, I think there's a hockey dad bundle as well. Like yeah. anyway, per perfect opportunity to go check it out. Grab your dad something cool. Um, and today's question about Troy Mann uh, is which former NHL coach convinced Troy Mann to get into coaching? If you know the answer to that, post it on Twitter using the hashtag Wally Mathot and be sure to tag at Gong Show Gear. Uh, contest closes Friday, June 4th at midnight, and we're going to reveal the winner on our next show. Also, uh, if you want, we can uh, get you mugs and t-shirts if you go to shop.wallymathot.com. Uh, and probably I can, I'll wear another Wally Mathot t-shirt next time since you guys are not happy with my wardrobe choice. Uh, if you like the content, you can like and subscribe us on YouTube. Of course, follow us along on uh, all the podcast networks. Special thank you to Troy, man. Fascinating conversation. We hope to have him back on to talk about AHL travels uh, another time. And uh, as Meth, it's always nice to see you. And thanks for watching the Wally Mathot Show. Powered by? Beth? Oh, do, do you want me to chime in again? Powered by Bar Haven Ford. <laughs>